Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Chris Burgess, and I'm the Head of Exhibitions and Public Programmes at Cambridge University Library. Just a couple of weeks ago, we opened our exhibition Samurai, History and Legend, a mere 18 months behind schedule. Uh, the exhibition, which has been curated by Dr. Kristin Williams, our head of J the Japanese section, explores the literary concepts of the samurai and the changing nature of, Jap of Japanese warrior culture from the 12th to the 19th centuries. We're delighted to have you all here this evening for our first in a series of talks exploring themes around Japanese books. And if people would like to see more of the Japanese collections, please do go to the exhibition. But if you'd like to see more of the Japanese collections, if you go on our digital library, um, there's a whole host of digitized material from um, the exceptional collections that we hold at the UL. About tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Peter Kornitsky is an Emirates professor of Japanese. Uh, educated at St George's College Weybridge and Lincoln College Oxford, he's taught at the University of Tasmania, Kyoto University, and then from 1985 at Cambridge, where he's been a fellow of Robinson College since 19, of Robinson's College since 1986. He's lived six years in Japan, mostly in Kyoto. He has established he has published extensively on the history of the book in Japan, and more recently on translation and interlingual interlingual transactions in East Asia. His monographs include The Book in Japan from the Beginnings of the 19th Century, which was published in 1998, and Languages, Scripts and Chinese Texts in East Asia, which was published in 2018. And he's been the co-editor of several collections of, Jap of essays, including The Female and su as Subject, Reading and Writing in Early Modern Japan, and Eavesdropping on Emperor, a study of wartime Japanese courses in Britain and the role of linguistics as codebreakers, translators, interrogators and eavesdroppers. He's a fellow of the British Academy, and in 2017, the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold Rays with Neck Ribbon, was conferred on him by the Japanese ambassador in London. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from Peter this evening as he explores how and why Japanese books made their way to England in the 17th century and what subsequently became of them. Over to you, Peter. Thank you for that kind introduction. Let me just get my slides starting. I hope they are now uh, completely visible to you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be giving uh, the first of the talks associated with the Samurai exhibition and I'm grateful to Chris for that kind introduction. And without any further ado, I would like to move forward. And I'd like you to put yourselves for a moment in the shoes of this man. His name was Richard Cox and he was already 46 years old when he was posted to Japan. The year is 1611, so he had no option but to set sail over the oceans, and he knew that he might never return home again. He left London on a ship called the Clove on the 11th of April, 1611, and he had a long and weary way ahead of him. Hardly anybody at that time knew anything about Japan in England, and we, knew, we know more now about the moon than Richard Cox knew about the country he'd been posted to. What's more, it took him longer to get there than it takes us to get to the moon. The Clove left London with two other ships. In overall command of this small flotilla was a man called John Saris, who had been entrusted by the English East India Company with the task of opening a trading relationship with Japan. Richard Cox was traveling on board as the chief merchant. He was the person with the trading skills who would have the task of actually conducting trade with Japan. Now, the East India Company already had a trading base sited in Bantam, Java, that's now Indonesia, and it's marked on the map um, by the yellow dot. It already had a trading base in East Asia. So that's where um, this small flotilla headed first, stopping on the way at Madagascar and Yemen. At Bantam, Saris decided to send the other two ships home with a cargo of spices. So it was just the clove that made its way to Japan, reaching the port of Hirado on the 11th of June, 1613. So it had taken more than two years for the clove to get to Japan after leaving London. Has anybody ever had such a long commute to work, I wonder? Why did they put in at Hirado? As you can see from the map on the slide here, 
it lies off the northwest coast of the island of Kyushu, the southernmost island of Japan. So it was very far from the center of political power in Japan, which was way over to the east in the city of Edo, now known as Tokyo. On the other hand, Hirado had certain attractions. Hirado had been a port town long engaging in trade with Korea and China. Portuguese traders had followed in the 16th century, and by the time that the little English ship, the Clove, put into harbor in the summer of 1613, Hirado was already a trading base for the Dutch East India Company as well. So although Hirado is not a city or port of any great importance now, at the time, it was one of the few international ports in Japan. The local daimyo or ruler was welcoming to foreigners, and that made it easier for the English to establish a foothold there. The first task, of course, was for John Saris to secure the right for the East India Company to trade in Japan. In his endeavors to secure the right to trade, he was helped by two factors. One was the fact that he brought with him lavish presents for the shogun, who was the de facto ruler of Japan. These presents included a silver gilt telescope, which was particularly remarkable because telescopes were a new invention in early 17th century Europe, and this was the first one to leave Europe. And the second factor that helped him was that there was already an Englishman based in Japan by the name of William Adams. Now, William Adams had arrived in Japan in 1600 in command of a Dutch fleet, which then secured the right for the Dutch East India Company to trade in Japan. Within a few months of his arrival, Tokugawa Ieyasu won a major battle over his, his rivals and became shogun in 1602. William Adams met him several times, both in 1600 and later on. And the shogun asked him to build a Western style ship. The shogun was very much appreciative of the finished vessel. And in this way, William Adams gradually won the trust of the shogun. And in due course, he became the shogun's advisor on trade and diplomacy, and he enjoyed samurai status. He was given the right to bear a sword in public, which was the, the visible badge of samurai status in Japan in the early 17th century. Adams apparently acquired a good knowledge of Japanese, though of course it's difficult now to know exactly how good his knowledge was. Could he actually read the language? or was his ability limited to the spoken language? It's really rather impossible now to know. At any rate, thanks to the presence and help of William Adams, the negotiations between John Saris and the Shogun in 1613 went well, and a permit was issued, as you can see here. In the top left-hand corner, you can see the official vermilion seal of the Shogun impressed on the paper to prove that it was authentic and to provide the seal of approval, which enabled the English to trade from this point on. And so thanks to the acquisition of this official permit, uh, the English East India Company was now in a position to begin trading. Adams uh, never returned to England. He stayed on in Japan until his death in 1620. He was allowed to undertake some trading voyages in East Asia, but he was not permitted to return to England. That's really a bit of a mystery. Was this because he knew too much about Japan? Perhaps, but we don't know for sure. Here is an extract of one of Adams's logbooks. You can see in the second line, um, underlined in red, the year 1617, three years before his death. Adam's logbooks reached the Bodleian Library in Oxford within a year or two of his death, though it's not really clear how they got there so quickly. But leaving that aside, once the permit had been issued with the help of Adams, 
the English were in a position to trade in Japan. And so John Saris, now that his job had been done, uh, left to return to England uh, to, towards the end of the year 1614. He left the chief merchant, Richard Cox, and 10 other Englishmen to begin work, the trading representatives of the English East India Company. They set up what they called a factory, in other words, a trading station in Hidado, the same port in which they had arrived. And they also set up sub factories in Osaka, in Sakai, and in Edo, now the city of Tokyo. They tried to sell the English wares which they'd brought with them, and they tried even to do some market research about the kind of English goods which would sell well in Japan. Think for a moment of the extraordinary difficulties they faced. None of them knew the language, although, of course, Adams was willing to help with the knowledge that he had. On top of that, a further difficulty was that the English broadcloth, woolen cloth, which they had brought out to sell in Japan, was mouldy and smelly after two years in the hold of a ship. So it was not really a very attractive product. But Richard Cox was a very enterprising and a clever man with a lot of experience and connections. And he wanted his mission to succeed. So he put some effort into getting trade underway and he endeavored to keep the business going. Who exactly was this Richard Cox? What more do we know about him? Well, we don't know a great deal about his life but these are the key stages in his life. And as you can see, he was initially apprenticed to a cloth maker. So from the very beginning, he was associated with fabric and the cloth trade. And he joined the cloth makers company and eventually joined the Merchant Adventures of England, uh, a trading company which traded uh, in other countries in Europe. From 1603 up to 1608, he lived and traded in Bayonne in southwest France. And it was there that he began passing intelligence, information, to a man called Thomas Wilson, who was the secretary of Robert Cecil, the first Earl of Salisbury. Please remember those names because they're going to come up again. In other words, Richard Cox was a part-time spy. And clearly that brought him some very valuable connections. For the first Earl of Salisbury was soon to become simultaneously the Secretary of State, perhaps equivalent now to the Prime Minister, and the Lord High Treasurer, equivalent now to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, both under Queen Elizabeth and then under King James afterwards. Now, Richard Cox reached Japan in the summer of 1613, as we have seen, and he stayed until the bitter end when the Hirado trading mission was closed down in 1623. Richard Cox died in 1624 at sea on his way home to England, but what became of his possessions is unknown. On the other hand, we are very fortunate to have most of the official diary that he kept as head of the English factory and many of his letters which survive today in the British Library. But unfortunately, the first two years of the diary are missing, and so are some of his letters. Nevertheless, it is clear that Richard Cox was very interested in books and brought a number with him to Japan. It's also clear that he learnt Japanese by having a Japanese woman move in with him in his official lodgings in Hirado, and that he started taking an interest in Japanese books. His letters document his interest in Japanese books very well. Four letters um, are quoted on the screen that you see in front of you, all written by him on the 10th of December, 1614. By this time, remember, he'd been in Japan about 18 months, not really long enough to learn much Japanese. The first letter he wrote to the Merchant Adventurers, now based in Middleburg in Holland. This was the organization he had been associated with earlier in his career. And he wrote to say that uh, I'm sending to your worships a Japanese almanac. And from that, you can see 
the order and way in which they print letters and characters and how they divide the year up into 12 months. So he's sending them an almanac. Um, and as we will see from the others, uh, he had quite a few almanacs at his disposal. The second letter was to John Saris, who had commanded the voyage out to Japan, as you'll remember, in 1611. And he wrote to say, um, just to paraphrase uh, uh, Richard Cox's um, 17th century English, I thought I'd sent you a Japanese almanac in a letter which I sent on the 25th of November uh, by way of the Sea Adventurer, um, which was sailing via Siam, but I forgot to put it in. Um, so I'm now sending it to you on this occasion. The third letter he wrote to Thomas Wilson, you remember that name, the secretary of Lord Salisbury, and he writes here, I'm sending you enclosed a Japanese almanac, and you can see here how they print uh, numbers and characters uh, from that. And finally, the fourth letter he wrote on that day was to Lord Salisbury himself in London. Enclosed, uh, your lordship will find a muster or memorial of the names of the most part of most of the great princes and lords of Japan, together with their yearly revenues. And from this, you can see how mighty is the empire of Japan. You will also find a Japanese almanac, and from that, your lordship can see how they print books in Japan. Right, it is clear from these four letters that Richard Cox had bought at least four copies of a Japanese almanac to send back to England. We will consider his motives and the addressees in a moment. The editor of the modern edition of these letters notes that the almanacs are not extant, but that turns out not to be true. In fact, two of them are extant, both of them kept today in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Here is one of them. It is a calendar for the year 1614, and therefore, of course, it was printed uh, the year before, at the end of the year 1613. By the time that Cox sent it to England in December 1614, it was, of course, nearing the end of its usefulness. Perhaps he found them remaindered and available cheap to buy. One doesn't know. At the top, you can see somebody has written Scriptura Japonica in Latin. Uh, Japanese writing. Whoever wrote this knew that that was the beginning of the text because, of course, the Japanese almanac, like Japanese books, starts on the right. This is not the hand of Richard Cox, but it may be the hand of Thomas Wilson, the Lord Earl of Salisbury's secretary. As you can see from the references on the right of the slide to the catalogue of the Bodleian Library's collections, which was printed in 1697, the two almanacs were at that stage already in the Bodleian Library. They must have left Japan by 1624, the latest, when the Hirado trading station was closed down. And it is most likely that these two almanacs are two of the four sent back by Richard Cox, probably the ones he sent to Thomas Wilson and to the Earl of Salisbury. How on earth did they get to the Bodleian? That's a bit of a mystery. Now, let's take a closer look at those four letters. You'll notice, and you perhaps have noticed already, that letters one, three, and four mention printing. Of course, none of the recipients of the almanacs uh, would have been able to understand a single word of Japanese. But that didn't really matter to Richard Cox. What he wanted the recipients to appreciate was that printing was practiced in Japan. Now that itself had probably come as a bit of a surprise to Cox. He'd known little about Japan and he had probably been surprised to find that printing was well underway in Japan, was a normal way of producing books. But in any case, his letters show his eagerness to explain what his enclosures reveal is it eagerness to explain that the enclosures show that the Japanese divide the year into 12 months and that they print books, including almanacs. So he's trying to show uh, how familiar the Japanese printing scene is in Japan and that the Japanese do things much the same as they do in England in terms of dividing time into 12 months and so on. But what about the muster 
which Cox mentioned in the last of those letters, number four, the letter to Lord Salisbury. Now this muster, in fact, only surfaced last year when Alessandro Bianchi, who took his PhD at Cambridge, it is now the Japanese librarian in the Bodleian, was digging around in the stacks of the Bodleian. Here is the top half of the muster, or list, perhaps we should call it. First of all, at the top, there is a preamble explaining that each individual's name is followed by that individual's income measured in terms of koku of rice. One koku is roughly five bushels in imperial measure. Take line two of the list of daimyo or, or barons of Japan. Um, it's a rather weirdly spelt entry, um, but it clearly refers to a man who is known to us as Tanaka Tadamasa, who had the title Chikugo no Kami, and did indeed have a, an annual income of 300,000 koku of rice, just as it says in the second line of the muster. So the information was indeed accurate, though it's not clear at this stage how the English managed to get hold of such information about the private incomes of the barons and daimyo of Japan. When Richard Cox sent this muster or list to the Earl of Salisbury, he naturally folded up, folded it up to include in his letter with a text on the inside and a blank sheet, a blank side on the outside. And on the outside, he wrote a brief explanation. And you can see this here on the left. It's really rather faint, but highlighted with ultraviolet, you can see it a lot more clearly. And you can see that it states that uh, this is the revenues of all the kings of Japan. Kings was the way in which the English tended to refer to the daimyo or provincial lords of Japan in the early 17th century. By the time that the muster and these almanacs reached England after a long voyage across the seas, the Earl of Salisbury, as it happened, was already dead. But his secretary, Sir Thomas Wilson, sent them along with two of Cox's letters to King James in March 1619. And Thomas Wilson added the explanation to the muster and the almanacs when he sent them to the king. And you can see that here in this slide. And as he explains to paraphrase what he wrote in 17th century English, the long scroll of very thin paper um, is one of their annual almanacs and shows the way in which they print characters. The other piece of paper is a statement of the greatness of the revenues of all the nobles under the Emperor of Japan. And most of them equal or exceed the revenues of the greatest princes of Christendom. Now, King James uh, saw all this and was very unimpressed. And he declared that Cox's account of Japan was the loudest lies. So all that effort went for nothing. As it happens, though, the king was right. Cox believed that the leading figures of Japan were fabulously wealthy, but that was because he used a faulty exchange rate. Let's move forward now to 1616. We find in Richard Cox's diary the entry that you see on the screen. On the 10th of November, 1616, he was in Kyoto and he bought 54 printed books, which he describes as antiquities and chronicles. The Japanese translators of Cox's diary assume that what he means is that he had bought a copy of the tale of Genji, the classic novel of Japan, which did indeed usually consist of 54 volumes. But to my mind, Antiquities and Chronicles is not really an appropriate way of describing a novel, even if it is a novel written in the 11th century. There is, I think, another solution. And that solution is, in fact, to be found in Cambridge University Library. This, surely, is the book that Richard Cox meant. It is a book titled The Azuma Kagami, or in English, The Mirror of the East, and it is indeed a historical chronicle covering the events of mostly the 12th and 13th centuries. What is more, this partial copy uh, 
preserved in Cambridge University Library and printed around the year 1615, shows that it came directly from Richard Cox. The inscription in the top right hand corner, which is transcribed in black writing on the slide, is actually in Richard Cox's own handwriting. How do I know that it's in his handwriting? Well, if we look at another sample, we can see for sure. This is a letter which was written, and if you look at the bottom, signed by Richard Cox, it says Rick Cox, and compare that with the inscriptions, uh, which I've just mentioned, and which are on the right of the slide in front of you. That is Richard Cox's handwriting, all right. Notice that the inscription is positioned correctly at the beginning of volume three, showing that Cox by this time knew that Japanese books started at the back from a European perspective. What's more, it correctly gives the volume numbers included, and again correctly states that they contain the Chronicles of Japan. Now the Latin writing uh, to the left at the top of the page, which on the slide is reproduced in red, um, is something that was added by somebody else, probably after its arrival in England. And it is completely wrong. Liber Sinensis Manuscriptus means Chinese manuscript book. But as Cox himself knew well, this was neither Chinese nor a manuscript, though it was indeed a book. We can give him that. Now, as the inscription in the bottom right of the slide shows, this book was in the hands of somebody called William Chidley of the Queen's College, Oxford, by the year 1626. Chidley was a clergyman and he never left England. So how he came by this book is a complete mystery. Most likely he had a relative connected with the East India Company for that is how some other Japanese book reached England at this time, as we will soon see. There is another early Japanese book in Cambridge, and that is in Sydney Sussex College. This is a copy of the printed text of a no play called Kiyotsune, which was again printed around the year 1615. We know that this book reached England in the 17th century, for it was donated by a man called David Viney to Sydney Sussex College in the 1680s. How did he get hold of it? Now, this is a puzzle we can only solve if we now turn to the Bodleian Library, for there we find three similar nor plays. Here is one of them, or the cover of one of them, with a lot of writing uh, on the cover. Um, some of it I have transcribed for you. At the top, we have a bit of Latin. Uh, Manuscriptus Libre Japonicus etiam de, de Idolorum Cultu Udeto, which roughly translated means Japanese manuscript also about the cult of idols, it seems. This is again completely wrong. This is not a manuscript and it has nothing to do with the worship of idols. Now these comments were made by a Chinese Jesuit who visited the Bodleian in the 1680s and who could not read Japanese. In other words, this is just mere guesswork. Now in the middle of the cover, circled in yellow, is some rather mysterious writing, which you will come back to in a moment. But now look at the bottom of the uh, cover um, and you will see that the donor of this book has written his name. Uh, he wrote it upside down because he imagined that this is the front cover European style and so tried to orient the book as Europeans were used to um, and of course therefore put his name upside down. Um, and on the right I have put it the right way up for you and you can see that the inscription tells us that Robert Viney of Magdalen Hall in Oxford which is now known as Hartford College donated it to the Bodleian in the year 1629. So he shares the same surname as the donor of the Sydney Sussex book, who was David Viney. 
Who was this Robert Viney? He was a Northamptonshire clergyman who never left England, rather like the William Chidley, who owned the Mirror of the East in the University Library in 1626. But in Viney's case, we can explain how he came by these books. Robert Viney's mother, Susan, was the sister of a man called John Jourdain, who joined the East India Company in 1607. John Jourdain served as the chief factor or the director of the uh, East India Company's operation at Bantam in Java, and he returned to England in 1617. What is more, John Jourdain was estranged from his wife and his son. So the chief beneficiary of his will was his sister Susan, Robert Viney's mother. Now, John Jourdain did not visit Japan as far as we know, but he certainly met Richard Cox in 1612, and he probably met him again in 1614, when Richard Cox's ship, the Clove, uh, docked at Bantam. Also, several letters from Richard Cox to Jourdain survive. And in a letter to the East Indian Company, written on the 10th of February, 1615, Jourdain states that he had recently received letters from Cox, so there can be no doubt that they kept up a correspondence. Given that Richard Cox knew Jourdain, that he was evidently a keen book buyer, and that Cox himself had seen some law plays performed in Hirado in 1613, it is almost certain that it was Cox who bought these books and sent them to John Jourdain. If so, if my hypothesis is right, he doubtless explained his gift in a letter that is now lost. Since Jourdain died in 1619, the books would then have come into the possession of Susan Viney, who was herself dead by 1622. Robert Viney came of age in 1628, and it's clear that he had no interest in these exotic books, so the next year, 1629, he donated them to the Bodleian. Perhaps he kept one in the family, for the David Viney who donated a book to Sydney Sussex College was in fact his son. So now we can see how these books reach Sydney Sussex College and the Bodleian Library through a family um, associated with the church in England who never left England. Now, what about that mysterious word in the middle that uh, I drew your attention to um, in a previous slide? Here you can see it a little bit more clearly. And although now very indistinct, it can also be seen on the cover of the Sydney Sussex book, which is shown here on the right. Now, this is a 17th century Englishman's transcription of the Japanese word mainohon. And in fact, he has accurately caught the Japanese tendency at the time to pronounce an H as an F. So he's written manohon, not manohon. And the word Manohon or Mainohon refers to performance texts like the texts of Nor plays. But that leaves us surely with another puzzle. Why would an Englishman write that Japanese word on the cover with no further explanation? My supposition is that when Cox sent these books to Jean Jodin in Bantam, they arrived with an explanatory letter just like those he sent to England in 1614 to accompany the Almanacs. That letter got lost, like the others that Cox sent to Jardin. But the books survived and reached the Viney family and through them eventually found their way into the Bodleian Library. Before I conclude, um, I would like to make a slight detour and look at a Chinese book. This is an inscription that is found inside a copy of the Book of Mencius, one of the Chinese Confucian classics, which arrived in England sometime in the early 17th century. And it carries an amusing, but unfortunately anonymous inscription, which reads as follows. Mr. Grimes, I've sent you a book printed in the language of China, to show you the form of their printing. But that language no man can understand apart from themselves. So here too, although 
here we're talking about a Chinese book, the fact that printing was practiced in China is assumed to be of interest to the recipient, even though neither of them knew any Chinese whatsoever. Now, the same was true of all the Japanese books I've spoken about today. There was not a single person in England, we can be sure, who could read them. But that did not stop people being interested in them as evidence of writing and printing in far-flung corners of the globe. Thomas Bodley, the founder of the Bodleian Library in Oxford, explicitly instructed his successors to acquire books in languages that nobody could read, in the belief, the enlightened belief, that one day they would prove useful and one day people would be able to read them. For that foresight, we have to be grateful, for otherwise these books would not have survived. It was only really at the end of the 17th century that Dutch and Germans started acquiring Japanese books. But by that time, there were already quite a few Japanese books in England, as we have seen. After the closure of the English factory in 1624, there were no more opportunities to acquire them. There were no more Englishmen in, in Japan, um, nor were they visiting Japan until the 1860s. However, at the end of the 17th century, some Japanese books in the form of manuscripts of plants, and I show one illustration here, um, reached Germany and subsequently were bought by the professor of botany in Oxford. And so those survive today in the Department of Plant Sciences uh, in Oxford. And so these were one other addition to the collections of Japanese books in England made in the late 17th century. After that, uh, it, we had to wait until the 1860s when Britain and other European countries began to establish diplomatic relations with Japan and diplomats like Ernest Sato and William Aston um, lived in Japan and acquired huge collections, which today form the core of the old Japanese collection in the university library. The books I've shown you today give us a glimpse of the interest taken in Japanese books in 17th century England, even though nobody could read a word of them. Now we can read them and they are a testament to the early relations in books between Britain and Japan. And I thank you for your attention. Um, thanks, Peter. That was uh, really, really fascinating. Um, and I, I, until uh, we started on uh, working with Kristen on the exhibition, I had no idea that there was um, such an early uh, kind of, in, well, influx is probably the wrong word, but you know, Japanese books were coming into the into into the UK um, from from such a kind of an, an early time, which I think is fascinating. Um, and we've got some questions coming into the Q and A. Um, one one of the things I was interested in just following up before we get onto that is um, you mentioned that the Dutch East India Company had um, an outpost in Japan. Uh, before um, uh, Cox got there, but were they not sending back to books back in the same way? Right. Um, the, the, the Dutch East India Company established a, uh, an outpost in Japan in 1600, um, the, um, but the person in charge of it was actually by chance an Englishman, William Adams. Um, but that was essentially a Dutch operation. As far as we know, um, the Dutch East India Company employees um, did not take any interest in Japanese books. This is a little bit surprising because the Dutch East India Company people in China were certainly taking an interest in, in Chinese books. And as early as 1605, um, and this is an extraordinary uh, detail, there was a shop in Amsterdam which specialized in selling Chinese books. Um, to interested Europeans. Not one person, of course, could read them, um, but people were interested to collect them. And 
that bookseller actually printed a catalog of the Chinese books he had for sale. That catalog sadly doesn't survive, um, but it's referred to in later catalogs. So it, it clearly did exist. So in China, the Dutch East India Company employees were interested in books. They're aware that Europeans were interested in them and they sent some back. But in Japan, as far as we can tell, it was only at the end of the 17th century that the Dutch began to take an interest in uh, Japanese books. Um, why why um, there is that difference is, is not easy to explain. Some people argue that um, it was only towards the end of the 17th century that uh, Dutch traders who had had a good education uh, began to get posted to Japan and began to take an interest uh, in Japanese books. Um, and certainly in the case of Richard Cox, he was um, a person who had had an education, who liked reading, who had a personal interest in books, um, as we see from his letters and diaries. So perhaps that explains why he took an active interest in Japanese books well before uh, the Dutch uh, traders um, who were active in Japan. But at any rate, it's thanks to his activities that we have all these books um, in England scattered between the Bodleian and Cambridge University Library. And uh, they was, as far as uh, we are currently aware, um, the first Japanese books uh, to reach Europe. It's, it's really interesting. And one of the other things that I'd, uh, I'm interested in, this collecting of things which you're not entirely sure what they are and having an interest in them. Um, I kind of, I feel like I have to ask about the Chinese Jesuits in, in Oxford and, and how, how he got there um, and, and, and miscataloging the, the books there. But this, this kind of, uh, the interest in the material just for the material sake, if, if that makes sense. Is there a sense of it being studied in the period between, um, which is astonishingly long period between the first books coming and then 1860 and presumably Japan opening up a bit more and more material coming? Uh, no, they, they, they really weren't studied uh, at all, um, at least uh, not in England. Um, in uh, Germany and um, some parts, particularly Berlin, let's say, um, there was from the very end of the 17th century, uh, the beginnings of an interest in Japanese script and the Japanese language. Um, and people started writing about them. But um, although the books were in England, nobody showed any interest in them really <laughs> until uh, much, much later. So it in some ways fulfills Thomas Bodley's uh, aspiration for the library, a repository for books that one day people will appreciate. And I'm glad to be able to uh, appreciate them now. Our librarians would say as well that we collect books you know for for perhaps that people might not want to read for a hundred years but we still we still collect them just so we so we have them um uh, exactly. we've got we've got a question were the books um uh woodblock printed or, or handwritten um and would the collecting be done for artistic merit presumably okay the content right um the books i have shown you um apart from the almanac uh, were all printed with movable type. Um, they were not printed from woodblocks. Um, this is because the arrival of the English and Dutch uh, in Japan in the very early years of the 17th century coincided with a boom time for movable type printing, which lasted only for about 40 years. Um, let me just say a little bit more about that. Movable type printing, uh, as as a tradition, as a technology, reached Japan in the 1590s from two quite separate sources. One was, of course, European typography, which reached Japan through the Jesuit missionaries operating in Japan. But there was a much older tradition of movable type printing in East Asia, which had been extensively practiced in Korea. And Korean movable type um, dates back to the 13th century. And Japan conducted an invasion of Korea in the 1590s, which brought a lot of Korean movable type books, as well as Korean print type to Japan. So from two different directions, uh, typography reached Japan. And there was a boom for about 40 years until typography was abandoned. Once again, woodblock printing became the dominant form of book production. So uh, what we see here, uh, are newly 
printed books using typography, uh, with the exception of the almanac, which um, didn't really uh, have a shape and design that was suitable for typography because it includes all sorts of symbols and quite a complicated layout. So the almanacs were always printed uh, using um, uh, woodblocks. Um, but none of the books I have shown you uh, were, were manuscripts. And in fact, I'm, I'm glad that that question was asked because uh, in some ways the, they show that what uh, Cox and perhaps his colleagues as well were buying were the, were the latest things. These were new um, and they, they were being uh, brought to Europe within a couple of years of their production uh, in Japan, um, which is really quite remarkable. So I'm just trying to keep keep track of the, the questions here. Um, uh, we have a question about another book in the Bodleian, uh, which I'm going to try and read out now, which is my, my pronunciation is going to be awful. Is that the Pia Jolliffe one? That's one, yes. Yes. Um, the the Kiddish Damban are, in fact, the, the books which were printed by the Jesuits um, in, um, in uh, Kyushu. Um, they, the Jesuits did quite a lot of printing there, um, not a great deal of the works they have, they printed have survived, um, but they printed uh, in Latin, they printed in Portuguese, they printed in Japanese written in Roman letters, and they also printed in Japanese in Japanese script. So um, they certainly did undertake quite a lot of, of printing. Um, I didn't mention any of the works they printed because I was really focusing on works printed um, in Japan by Japanese in, in Japanese. Um, but it's certainly true that um, some of them did reach Japan, uh, did, sorry, did reach the Bodleian in the course of the 17th century. Um, and undoubtedly, um, the, uh, the Jesuit uh, missionary publications that survive in other European libraries also arrived in the course of the 17th century, um, along with books that came from China as well. So um, there was a flow of, of books from East Asia, um, but, but what seems to me particularly remarkable is these books actually written in Japanese and produced in Japan for a Japanese audience. Um, most of the books that were produced by the Jesuits, uh, the books that are called now Kirish Damban, were um, produced for the Jesuits themselves rather than produced for distribution within Japan. Um, yeah, we have a, another question. Um, uh, you, and it, it's from Sally Dorr, and it says, yeah. really interesting, many thanks. I think I gather that you found these examples by checking out the holdings in libraries and then investigating their provenance. Do you think more references might be found maybe to no longer existing examples by following up any of the archives relating to the others of the trading company personnel? Yes, um, I am absolutely convinced that uh, there are more of them around. Um, uh, let's just take that Antiquities and Chronicles, the Mirror of the East, uh, which of which Cambridge University Library has uh, four volumes out of the 54. There are, in fact, another three volumes, I didn't mention these, which made their way to Ireland and are today to be seen in the Library of Trinity College, Dublin. They have the same handwriting by Richard Cox in the corner. Um, so that accounts for seven of the 54. Where are the other 47? Uh, what's clear is that Richard Cox parceled them up. You know, although this was one set of books, I mean, the fact that it was one set made had no sense for anybody in, in Britain. So what he did was pass them up and send them uh, to assorted people. We don't know who they were sent to, um, um, but we know who, in whose hands they ended up. So we can account for seven of them. And my guess is that uh, he parceled other lots of three or four volumes uh, to other individuals. And I suspect that they are sitting still in country houses um, in England or maybe Scotland and Ireland um, to this day. I've written, Chris, to a very large number of them, but of course um, the librarians and archivists in those country houses won't recognize these as Japanese books. So uh, it's really rather like looking for a needle in a haystack. But uh, Sally Dor was quite right. There, there certainly 
uh, are more to be found. Um, we can also find that uh, Richard Cox refers to one or two other books or single sheets at any rate that he sent back to England, which so far uh, haven't come to light. Um, so um, what I've spoken about is what we know about at this stage. But remember, a year ago, we didn't even know that muster list of names had survived. Thanks to Alessandro Bianchi's uh, digging around in the Bodleia, we now have that. Um, more will come to light in due course, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure they will. I think anyone who's ever spent any time in um, in kind of big libraries of uh, uh, rare books and manuscripts knows that these treasures uh, turn up all the time. We actually have a question in the chat. Um, I've seen that one, the one from Marinellas. That's right. Right. Um, uh, who asked a bit more about the exchange rate error. Um, this is actually a very tricky question. Um, to start off with, uh, Richard Cox lists the uh, what he calls the revenues of, of each of the daimyo. Um, and he understands these revenues to be their personal income. And um, uh, he then gives an exchange rate uh, for um, the rice um, in pounds, shillings, and pence. Um, and if we follow his conversion, uh, we end up with uh, daimyo, that is local provincial lord incomes, um, approaching uh, a billion pounds. Um, there's something very clearly wrong, especially when you think that the Earl of Salisbury, uh, who's, who was said to be uh, the man with the largest income in England at the time, uh, did not have an income of £100,000. Um, so one of the problems was that Richard Cox was, was confusing the productivity of the land with the daimyo, with the feudal uh, lord's personal income. So actually he was not comparing like with like to start off with. Uh, the second reason is, the second thing, interesting thing is that the exchange rate given in the muster, uh, which is eight pounds per, um, per koku, per five bushels, is um, exactly eight times the rate, uh, which he wrote, give in a letter, gave in a letter he wrote two years later, in 1618. So um, it's clear that the at this early stage, when this muster was sent back to England, uh, he got the exchange rate completely wrong. Where he got it from, I don't know. I'm looking into that at the moment. Um, but it exaggerated hugely um, the apparent worth of the daimyo of Japan. So no wonder King James said, uh, this is all rubbish. And uh, he's dead right. Um, it was rubbish. The Japanese laws were not by not the richest um, in or richer than, than all the laws in the whole of Christendom. They were they had uh, land which had an income of a large amount, true, but the the amounts which Richard Cox calculated were um, completely wrong. Um, why this error was made, um, I really don't know. Um, as Marinella says, it's interesting the merchant would, would make such an error. Um, but I suspect he got confused between the, the uh, rates of uh, exchange and also the, the measurements uh, in Japan. So something's gone wrong there, but I, so far I've not been able to work out exactly uh, what is wrong. huge area when you put it like that is it it's quite outstanding really um uh we've got a question when could scholars in england first confidentially distinguish between chinese and japanese texts uh not really until the um the late 19th century um if i can give a, a brief anecdote i'm not sure that people many people can actually distinguish uh, <laughs> when i was an undergraduate at oxford living in in uh lodgings, um, my landlady asked me whereabouts in China Tokyo was. Um, so uh, she hadn't really got a clear idea of a distinction between uh, Japan and China. Um, uh, it's complicated partly because um, Japanese texts make use of a lot of um, Chinese, so-called Chinese characters. Um, so at first sight, many Japanese texts have uh, a visual similarity to, to Chinese texts. Um, and you therefore need to have some knowledge of the written, written 
of the script of one or other of those languages in order to be able to confidently distinguish between the two. That uh, Chinese Jesuit who was in the Bodleian in the 1690s should have been Morris and said, this is not Chinese, I cannot understand it. But instead, he jumped to the conclusion that because it was written by Japanese, it had to have been written by non-Christians and therefore it was, had to be all about idol worship. Uh, absolute nonsense, of course. <laughs> Uh, on sort of generally, was literacy limited to higher classes in Japan or more widespread? I mean, that's clearly qu probably quite a big, uh, quite a big answer. I would have thought. Yeah, um, uh, it wasn't limited to the higher classes in Japan because uh, literacy, um, even at this early stage in the 17th century, was becoming functional. Um, that is to say, uh, in every village, there had to be people uh, who had some basic command of literacy in order to deal with tax demands to uh, write uh, pleas for tax reduction in years when there had been a famine or a poor harvest and so on. So literacy become functional even in uh, rural communities. So um, it's clear that there was uh, some spread of literacy to farming communities, as you can see from the huge mass of uh, written archives that survive in Japan today, which consist of uh, documents which have been created by, by villagers um, and uh, they have used their literacy in order to make records, to make legal precedents, to make appeals and so on and so forth. So um, it wasn't by any means limited to the higher classes, but in terms of reading difficult texts, um, that ability and knowledge of Chinese were most likely limited to uh, educated people in the largest cities. You have a few questions about um, the isolation, sort of isolationist nature of, of, of Japan at parts in parts of during the uh, uh, the period you're talking about. But I think that that might be a larger larger question that we can get into um, uh, yeah. now. Presumably um, that re it, it impacted on the way that the number of books that came. Yeah, well, I mean, this uh, isolation um, is really a bit overdone. I mean, it's mostly done from a, a European perspective. It's true. Um, that uh, Japan was by and large isolated from uh, contacts with Europe. Um, but of course, an exception has to be made for the Dutch East India Company, who maintained an outpost in Japan throughout from, the, from 1600 right through until um, the 1870s. Um, and what's more, um, there were uh, close and continuous contacts between uh, Japan and China and Japan and Korea. Um, throughout the period. So Japan wasn't totally isolated. Um, and indeed, from 1700, or 1690s or so onwards, uh, the Dutch did begin to bring Japanese books and porcelain, lacquerware and so on, back to Europe. And they began to realize that that was uh, a bit of a money earner for them. Um, and so that way, um, Japanese books did begin to reach Europe um, in the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. And you can find collections being built up uh, at that stage. So Japan wasn't totally isolated, even from Europe. And there was a flow, a thin flow, true, but there was a flow. Um, and uh, for example, the Dutchman Isaac Titzing built a very large library um, and brought it back to Europe. And those books uh, I found in Manchester about 20 years ago, um, where they'd lain for over 100 years, neglected and unrecognized. I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a lot of stories of, of Japanese books lying uh, neglected and unrecognized for uh, last few years. Yes. Um, uh, well, that was, uh, we've, we've sadly run out of time, uh, Peter, but that was absolutely uh, fascinating. And thank you so much for starting the um, events program uh, related to the exhibition. Um, Samurai History and Legend uh, is a public exhibition. It's open six days a week. It's free to visit and open now until the 28th of May, uh, 2022. Um, and for information about the exhibition, including opening times and links to the Japanese collection on the Cambridge Digital Library, visit the Cambridge University Library website. I should also say, which Kristen, uh, the exhibition curator, has put in the chat that uh, the CUL copy of the Azuma Kagami is in the exhibition, so you can go and see it. That's um, the mirror of the East. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is in the yeah, exactly. Um, so please do go and see it. And I would also say, uh, given uh, the past two years, uh, we've had lots of nice comments about people going to see real books in person, 
um, which is quite a wonderful thing to do. So do go and do go and look at the collections, which are actually the exhibition is, 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 is amazing and the collections are absolutely wonderful. So please do go and see it. Um, as uh, previously mentioned, tonight's talk was the first in the series. Uh, the second will be uh, Art and Commerce at Play, the illustrated book in early modern Japan with Dr. Elias Tinius on Thursday, the 10th of March. And you can register for this event on our website as well. Um, and so uh, it, all that's left for me to say is thank you very much, Peter, for uh, a really uh, wonderful um, uh, talk. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you also to all those who tuned in and for the questions which uh, pushed me in various interesting directions. And thank you also, Chris, Francesca, for the opportunity to give this talk. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.